Hey everybody, Van Holstein here, helping your business take flight. And I'm really happy today to be sitting with Stephanie Van Dam with Sandler Training. Welcome, Stephanie. Uh, hi, Dan. Thanks so much for having me. Glad you could make it. So, Stephanie, you run a sales training operation. Tell us a little bit about you know what you do, who you serve, and some of your services. Yeah, thanks, Dan. So we work with businesses, um, sort of small teams who are uh, they've built a good sales team. Uh, they love what they do. Uh, but they might be struggling in creating efficiencies in communication, or they have people who are really great at their trade and maybe struggling a bit on how to communicate their, their value to their clients. And so, or people saying, Hey, I spend a lot of time, you know, the, we all feel more comfortable talking to existing clients. And so, but we know that we need to be talking to new clients. So how do we transition that comfort level from uh, getting out to new clients instead of just talking to the ones we already have? Gotcha. It, it's so much easier. And what I see with the businesses, uh, business owners I work with, they're super comfortable receiving an inbound call, but make and having that sales conversation, adding value. But that outbound always seems to be for many people a challenge. Why do you think that is? Well, we're as we're experiencing, people are scared of the unknown. Right? We're scared a bit of rejection. We're scared a little bit of taking risk. If you're a business owner, there's a ton of risk in our business anyway. So now you're asking me to do one more. Like it's so much easier if I just receive the call. Can I just yeah. spend a lot of money on marketing and lead generation and people will just call me? That would be yeah. the fairy tale. Well, that would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and it's, exactly. it's true for some businesses as well. They do have a lot of inbound. But even if you're receiving an inbound call, I mean, you, you need to be able to to be, to be able to sell. Do, do you think there's any such thing as a born salesperson? Can you hear that term? They were born to sell. Like, do you believe that that's a, a thing at all? Um, I like to think of it. So I have a bit of a different perspective of the salesperson. A lot of us. Th so to answer that question better, I need to go back and say sales to me um, has that awful stereotype. There's a lot of people that have a negative stereotype of salespeople, the aggressive, maybe dishonest, unethical um, salesperson. And so are some of those people born? No, I don't think those people are born. Um, I think that for me, the best salespeople are people who are passionate about what they do and are curious about the people they want to talk to. They want to be able to, they're sort of special uh, specialty solution providers that fix problems. And so if you're able to, if you are interested in solving a problem, then you are, I think, a great salesperson. And so are those people born? I think, you know, perhaps curiosity. Yeah. Um, but I think that also can be coached in people. I think that can be trained as to how to ask those questions the right way. For sure. And, you know, to touch on the definition that you kind of shared there, the definition I learned years ago of a salesperson is a professional person or a person professionally helping somebody else solve a problem or fulfill a desire. And love that. Yeah, because it's all about positivity. It's all about actually serving as opposed to getting something like trying to get a sale. You're giving, you're giving value, you're providing solutions and, and you're helping somebody. Um, yeah. you know, if, if we talk about some of the old sales axioms, like, you know, born salesperson or ABC, always be closing. <laughs> what are your thoughts on always be <laughs> <Yes>. closing? <laughs> Well, it makes great cinema for sure. We'll, we'll put a link <laughs> but, here to Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. So, uh, yeah, I think that th that's the stereotype. That's a, and it obviously fed by media, but it's uh, a lot of people. It's, it's also supported by a lot of people out there who, who believe that that's true, who believe that you need to do the hard close to get the sale. And that's, I, I mean, I don't. I don't want to be sold like that, right? Mm -hmm. Why would I ever want to do that? So that's not if people, some people come to me saying, I need, I have a closing problem. And so what I like to share with them is you probably don't have a closing problem. You might have a qualification problem. And so I like to take the ABC and make it ABQ, which is always be qualifying Love or it. always be questioning. Yeah. Awesome. I, and th that sounds great. And I, I like also ABS, always be serving. And so that's, they all kind of, yeah work together. Well, what do you think are some of the challenges people have or business owners specifically when they're, when they're in a sales role, they may be very good technically what they do. And I think a lot of business owners find themselves in this position, at least initially, they're great at whatever their product or service is, and they get busy, they end up doing the selling. And then after a while they realize, Hey, I need someone to help me with these sales because I'm busy doing fulfillment. What are some of the challenges you see when business owners make their first hire of a salesperson? Yeah, great question. So there's a couple of answers to that. One would be 
business owners have, because it's their business, they're very passionate and knowledgeable about whatever product or service that they're selling. Mm -hmm. And there's some nuances to that, that their new salesperson may not have. And so there may be a lot of uh, assumptions and presumptions made about what somebody would or should know as they're having a conversation. We find a lot of business owners when they are transitioning, they're like, well, I don't know what I do. I just do it. <laughs> and it's the sales and so it's, Yeah, they just they, it's hard for them to define those steps before they so then they can't pass that on to the next salesperson. So that's a struggle for that new person. It, it's almost um it's hard to help them succeed in that situation. The other part is that when uh, business owners are recruiting people, uh, many times recruiting is not their strong suit. They're obviously doing all the other things involved in the business ownership. So they can get um, sold on the salesperson and end up paying a lot for like a base salary for someone because they are then sold on that and maybe not doing the great um, process that needs to be done to be able to get the sales. So I've seen many a business owner get burned a bit by making a poor hire and maybe not doing the right assessments on the individual, you know, the slowdown to hurry up. Uh, they, a lot of business owners hire out of pain instead of from a proactive measure. Yeah. And we, we all know that when we're acting out of pain, it's emotional and we're not in our, our best logical thinking mode in that case. And also, we're yeah. very often if we're, in, if we're in pain, like we, we need someone looking after this or that or looking after the sales because we can't get to them. Um, the challenge can be we're so compressed for time that we don't make good decisions. The first person that kind of looks like maybe they can do the job, we give them a shot and we regret it. <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> I, I was speaking with a couple of business owners last week, two, two different ones, and uh, they each indicated that um, at different points in time, they've hired salespeople um, and had zero sales for several months and one was actually a year. It would, now it's a longer sales cycle business, but... Um, so you mentioned something that I think ties into that, why sometimes salespeople, you hire the wrong person, they don't get results. You mentioned about the business owner has the steps they take in order to make a sale. So I think what you're referring to is really the process that that, sales pro, that, that business owner uses. So can you, can you speak a little bit to the importance of a sales process and for those that aren't really aware what that is? Yeah, absolutely. So it's super easy for us to understand the sales process from when we maybe get a customer. So a lot of people, we, there are processes around all of our businesses. So what we find misses though is what's the sales process. When we first initiate a conversation with a customer, what's the next step? How do we follow them through from a hello to signed credit card, PO, yes, I'm a customer. So for, uh, and that can follow two things. How many times do I need to have a conversation? Do I go from a, uh, a phone call to an email to a face-to-face -face meeting to, um, to then a decision? Is that how that works? Um, and, or is that in a long sales cycle, do I need to have six, eight meetings and um, and an email and a spec and a site visit? And you know, what are those steps in that, in that process? Uh, and then what's said within those steps. So how do you conduct a meeting so that you're able to get the information you need to get from every meeting that you have? So there's a couple of different um, sets of a way of thinking about a sales process. Yeah, and something that you mentioned is about if, it, if some businesses or industries have a longer sales process. And I think that one of the challenges that new salespeople have, and you can let me know if, if, you, if you've noticed this, they try to rush, yeah. rush the sales process or they're really excited to make that sale. And they don't follow the process or they, it's not been structured enough. They work, they're too aggressive or too quick and they don't understand sort of the nuances of that, the industry and they end up burning the leads because they're being a little bit too aggressive. Do you ever see that happening with some of the longer sales cycle businesses? I, yeah, absolutely. And I also see it with, with a lot of just new people in general mm -hmm. is that we've all been, um, you know, when we were kids, we all were socialized that the person who had the most knowledge was the most liked, right? In school, if you knew all the answers, the teacher liked you or the teacher's pet, or you got the scholarship, you got the gold star, the honor roll, all of that stuff. So um, a lot of us feel like if I just tell you how smart I am, then surely you will want to do business with me. It's sort of this, of course. And the problem that, that we find with a lot of new people is that they're so passionate about wanting to make their mark early and to let the business owner know that they made a right decision, that then they go into this conversation with a customer where they just speak about all the wonderful things that they know about them. And as a customer, we don't 
we don't, it, we don't care. <laughs> really, we just don't care. We want it to be about us as the customer. So I think that there's, um, there's two parts to do, like you mentioned, but also they just, people get too excited and, and, and go right through and the conversation topics are just, um, you know, misled. So they show up and just puke data all over the, the prospect's desk. Well, I would, <laughs> I was going to say affectionately vomit, but yes, <laughs> same idea. Yeah. It's, it's an interesting perspective why they're doing that. They're, they're, I think when someone does that and if they're new, you know, no fault to them, but if you're in a, if you're a seasoned or experienced salesperson and you're struggling, you have, we have to look at where's the focus going. If you're showing up and it's all about you or all about your product, that, that's the focus is going the wrong direction, isn't it? It needs to be always on the prospect. So what are, what are some tips to, to help a salesperson or a business owner that does sales sort of keep that top of mind and, and make sure that they don't get into that mode of kind of me, 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 product feeds and speeds, features and benefits? Yeah, a great question. And what I see a lot in it, again, it's a slow down to hurry up thing, which is, are you doing a pre-call plan? So all we need to, all we need to do is to create the plan of how to, uh, and think, begin with the end in mind, as the cliche goes, which is what kind of questions do I want to, if I'm a salesperson, what do I need to report to my leader? If they say, how did the sales call go? I can't just say, oh, it went well. It was a good call. We had a great, right? we had a great chat. Yeah. So <laughs> they're really as a nice. Leader, <laughs> and they always are, aren't they? <laughs> like, so the leader wants to, what do you want to know? When your salesperson comes out of that call, what are the pieces of information you want to find out about your customer? And then have I created the question set at the beginning prior to the meeting that enables me to, to be triggered to ask those questions during our, the conversation? So that would be probably the biggest piece. And I find that if we have that trigger in front of us, if we've taken the five, 10 minutes before our meeting to say, here's how I want to lay the meeting here the, is the, you know, the mutual agreement we're going to have here's the outcome I want to end up with. Uh, and here in the middle are the questions that I need to ask and the answers I'm looking for. And what kind of questions is my customer going to ask me and how am I going to answer those? Um, and so how am I going to navigate that conversation process? So do the pre-call plan. Like I said, take five, 10 minutes to do that. And, and that will help guide you through the rest of the call. I think that's, a, it's critical that as salespeople, we do that because otherwise you can get into a conversation. I've seen this happen. It's happened to me where when I was newer in sales, I would sit down with somebody all excited about whatever we were, my business was at the time. And they get off on a tangent. And I would follow that tangent, go down that rabbit hole because I didn't have a structured plan for the conversation. And we would go and go and I'm trying to bring it back it was very difficult. Then, oops, we're out of time. And it was just a nice visit. <laughs> you know? So I, I see that. I have no idea what you're talking about. No, of course. <laughs> we, we weren't born perfect salespeople. <laughs> right. But I think it's a, it's a really important point that you make about having that, having that preparation because it does a couple of things. The one is you're going to have confidence and clarity of what should happen in the meeting. Um, and then also you can keep your focus on the, on the, on the prospect or on your soon to be mm -hmm. new customer. And I think that the questions that, that you create and that you guide them through need to make sure the focus is always on them and having them understand that there's value to be had from engaging, uh, but without yeah. making it all about you, right? They, there's an excellent book by um, Donald Miller called building a story brand. And it talks about mm -hmm. how as a salesperson or the service provider, we're the guide. We're not the hero, the customer's the hero. And we're the guide and they need to see that we've got a plan that we can help them, you know, avoid failure and, and achieve success in whatever realm it is that we can help them. I think that's so important yeah. to, to put ourselves aside and really just be there for the, for the client. Um, yeah. How do you, how do you gu guide somebody who is maybe in a sales slump and they really want to make that next sale? How do you guide them on sort of getting the right attitude and the right focus so that they don't go in and just, again, do that, be aggressive or do the data dump? Um, at, at their prospect? How, how, do you, how do you guide them to kind of yeah. get their head in the right space so that they can really be serving and not selling? Great uh, question. So when we, a couple of answers to that. One of them is a lot of us have, um, have we set up the behaviors? Like what are we supposed to be doing on a daily basis? weekly basis, monthly basis, whatever that is, whether that's calls, emails, like link, reaching out on LinkedIn, um, what are the tasks that we need to be doing on a daily basis? And I'm going to, the, the, the parallel to sports here is, um, is great because oftentimes some of our favorite athletes get into scoring slumps too. So they get into performance issues. And so some of the things they get stressed about it. And so the 
solution in that case, as well as in this one, is just keep doing your behaviors. Keep doing the actions that you know have been successful for you in the past and don't really change those. Keep doing the behaviors, keep making the calls. Uh, Sandler has a rule that every call that you get a no earns you compound interest. So you'll be able to get that back. You just need to keep performing and, and, and tasking your way through, um, through the process. So that would be, if you had to say the biggest one as far as do the behaviors. And I know even, especially when you don't feel like them, we've all been to the gym. Let me back up. We've all joined a gym and then we've all <laughs> felt like <laughs> we didn't want to go, right? We didn't, you wake up and you're like, don't want to go, don't want to go, don't want to go. And then we go and then we feel amazing afterwards. Yeah. And so a lot of times the doing the behavior actually will change the attitude um, and the mindset. Uh, so that's a big part of what, of what we talk to, to people for. Um, Just kind and, of getting in that, setting yourself up to actually yeah. take those actions. They say, you know, talking about going to the gym to make it easier, um, have your gym clothes laid out the night before. So when you get up, they're yeah. staring you in the face like, okay, that's one bit of friction out of the way to get dressed and just directly go. Um, I think it was Jim Rohn who said, um, there's two types of regret, or pardon me, two types of pain in the world, the, the pain of discipline and the pain of regret. And, you know, the pain of discipline weighs ounces, but the pain of regret weighs tons, you know? So as a salesperson that's not doing their behaviors, and I like to talk to you about what some of those behaviors are, they get to that yeah. point where they're in a slump and that's the pain of regret because if they only did the behaviors, they wouldn't be there. So what, what are some of the, your, your best thoughts around the behaviors that every salesperson, regardless of what industry they're in, what, should, uh, what are those key behaviors that um, are always going to be getting, uh, helping that salesperson move forward? Right. So this is going to depend a bit on the salesperson themselves. And I will be the first sales trainer that tells you, you don't need to make cold calls. What? What? Some of you do. So this is not a pass, <laughs> <laughs> but there are people that don't. Um, and so how I like to divide our customers up and, and I'll give you a strategy, but I'm sure people have different strategies of how you're going to divide your customers up. Are you, um, and so we have a, an acronym called CARE, K-A-R-E. So what clients do you want to keep? Who do you want to attain? Who do you want to recapture? And who do you want to expand business with? Within each of those categories, you're going to have your list of people. And what do you need to do for them? So for some of your keep people, that is, can I just give them a call and a, you know, as a, a check-in call and see how they're doing? Do I do that via an email? Do I send them a handwritten note? Uh, do I send them um, lots of restaurants and things they're sending? Can I send them, I don't know, flowers? Can I send their team a meal? Uh, all of these different things, can I, whenever we start getting back together again, can I take them out to a function? So what are, the, uh, what are the behaviors that I need to do for keep? Now, attain is going to be a bit different because now I'm just in ac pure acquisition phase. So that may be where I need to follow in the cold call. And maybe that's the warm call. Obviously, follow up on some of those leads. Maybe that involves networking events. And that's an interesting um, topic now because at, at this moment, obviously, we're not able to do networking in the traditional way that we used to know yeah. it. So... What are those things uh, for you working on? In all cases, you're working on some sort of referral structure or introduction type structure. What are you doing in, in that situation? So it's about taking your total, what do I need? To, how many meetings do I need to do to get a sale um, or presentations to get a sale? How many meetings do I need to get to get a presentation? How many first calls do I need to get a meeting? And then from once I figure out those numbers, I just bat, you know extrapolate how many calls, how many contacts do I need to make and uh, and that's on a daily weekly monthly basis so that's how we can work that out I'm just trying to think of any others but I think you hit on some really important ones there something that you're sort of inferred is that keep track of your numbers like know those ratios right the, the conversion ratio from like you said from from lead to conversation to meeting to proposal to sale uh, I think that, that's a critical thing because it could be you know, we have multiple conversion ratios in our process, unless you're maybe at retail and someone walks up to the counter, chooses the piece of gun they want and buys it. There's going to be a conversation that has to be had. Maybe yeah. you're going to help someone try something on or get them a different color of something. So there's going to be a bit of a process. Um, and so I, what I see sometimes with folks that struggle with sales, they, they say, well, I'm not doing very well with my sales. And that's such a blanket, broad thing to say, because it's usually broken down 
somewhere along the path, there's, there's, a, there's a break in the linkage and usually it's something to do with conversion. You know, someone could be great at when they get the meeting, they, they have a very high close ratio, but they have trouble getting the meeting booked sort of thing. So I, I think if you, like you, you said, if you know your numbers and you track that, you can find where those bottlenecks are and then, and then go to work on those things. Well, yeah. And for anybody who is saying, okay, great, Stephanie, love this. I have no idea what my conversion rate is. I don't know what that is. Then here's a th guess. Pick a number. You got to start somewhere. And um, and then after a month, then you can decide, have, do I, have I got it right? Do I need to adjust it? So you've got to start somewhere and then um, adjust from there. Makes sense. And, and just for anyone who's watching this that doesn't know what we're talking about specifically with conversion rate, it's, you know, the activity of going from one step in your sales conversation to the next, right? So if someone could say no to you or yes, and they say yes, that, that's a conversion. Um, what, what do you think it generally takes to be a successful salesperson? That's a great question. I think that it takes, uh, in short form, I think it takes a, a high level of commitment. Um, uh, of consistency, of conviction, and a very low need to have your emotional feelings satisfied by your customer. Oh, that's a good one. Let's talk about that for a second. So a low <laughs> emotional need to have your, how is it? How did you phrase that? Just to say, have a low need to have your emotional needs met by your customer. Right. So stereotypically, the people who are involved in the sales industry are very social people. We get into it because we like talking to people. We enjoy that. And the, it's wonderful for that because what means we're probably pretty good at networking. Uh, when we have a conversation and meeting people that we can generate conversation quite easily. Um, it also means though, that if somebody says no to us or presents some sort of conflict, then our feelings get hurt because we feel like they're, they're um, rejecting us as individuals instead of our product or service. And so that, that, process of getting our feelings hurt is one of the major reasons why a lot of salespeople don't succeed or why it might take them longer to succeed because they feel like they're being rejected. Right. So, so. I, that, that's a great point. And I, I think anyone who's ever done sales when they've had that no, they felt rejected, yeah. but can, 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 a, can a prospective client truly reject us though? Like as a human, can they reject us? Well, no, they don't know you. Right. And so, I, I think yeah. that's, that's a critical piece there that, that yeah. leads that, re, that, that call reluctance or meeting reluctance is people fear being rejected. And I think you touched on it earlier that they're not rejecting you. They're just rejecting what you have on offer. And they're actually just rejecting what you have on offer right now. Because I think we've probably all had the experience where somebody said no. And we agree to circle back in three, six months next year, whatever it is. And then they are ready. Right. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Things have changed. We, and through recovery, it's likely that more decision makers are going to be working from home. Um, how do we set ourselves up for success in terms of being able to sell in that, in that new environment? Yeah, a great question. So we've got, there's two people to consider here. Obviously, us as the salespeople and mm -hmm. our customer or prospect. So as, uh, as a salesperson, have I done the right things to, do I have the right technology? Am I familiar with the technology that I'm using, whether it's Zoom or uh, Teams or I don't know, whoever else, whatever else technology you're using, are you familiar with it enough? And are you familiar with it enough to be able to explain it to your customer? Because they may not use it. I have a client right. where I use Zoom a lot to deliver my training, uh, but I have a client who uh, needs to use Teams based on the security for their, for their corporate yeah. environment. So I, I need to know both of those. So are you familiar enough with them? Your client may need to use something different. That's a great point. So be versed in all the different technologies yourself. Get proficient so you can engage with whatever communication modality your, your prospects and clients have. That's a great 100%. point. 100%. Um, and the other thing that I have is that a lot of what we're doing now, one of the reasons we love in-person meetings so much is because then we have a connection, but a lot of it is about the body language communication that exists. And so as much as we can, how can we replicate that? And so a lot of people feel very uncomfortable being on video. Mm -hmm. Part of when you set expectations for a meeting, is it important for you as a salesperson to be able to have your decision maker, your, your client, your influencer on video so that you can see them and they can see you, of course. So that's a big part. And then what are you wearing? Like there's the personal image branding piece that goes along with that. What's in the background? Are you seeing loads of laundry and you know um, toys and stuff like that? There has been, now that we're, we're moving into this, 
the level of tolerance that exists to see pets and children and spouses in the background while used to be sort of cute and you know adapting we're all in this together is now we're like okay now we've been this for a while we we know better and we need to be able to yeah exactly so uh so that would be that and and be able to have a little fun with it uh i've got clients who are used to you know, they're, they're 20 year salespeople. They're used to doing deals on golf courses and over steak lunches. And, uh, we can't do that anymore. Well, maybe a golf course is a little bit now, but a lot yeah. of how people are selling is different. Right. And so can you, um, can you send, have a, the lunch delivered to your client and then you have lunch delivered to you and you have lunch together over the conversation. I get it's not Great the idea. same, but it, could it be as close as possible? So what are the creative ways that you can still feel comfortable and, and sort of do business um, virtually? Awesome. Well, Steffi, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much. You shared such great insights and tips. I really appreciate that. Um, if somebody wants to reach out to you, what's the best way to, to reach you? Uh, yeah, my email address is stephanie.vandam at sandler.com. Um, or of course there you could just search up Sandler Hamilton and uh, find us on social media or uh, our website. Awesome. Well, we could probably uh, do a part two on this. Or we're just scratching the surface, I think so. But uh, for now, thank you so much, Stephanie. I really appreciate it. And uh, thanks again. 